And it's four o'clock. You're watching Chelsea and Tony live. And we have an exciting news story for you tonight about a hack on a Canon camera. Ransomware can be installed on your camera. Tony is going to talk more about that. He actually, in a past life, was an expert on that. So that should be interesting. And this week, we're going to be reviewing your street photos. So if you have not already submitted those, go to stp.io slash submit and get them in. We're also going to announce the Camera of the Year Awards from EISA. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> but first, let's take a moment to thank our sponsor, Squarespace. Whether you need a website, domain, or online store, make your next move with Squarespace. It's so easy to do if you can drag and drop. You can make your very own. Go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea and use the coupon code Chelsea to get 10% off. Um, so as I was saying, this week we're reviewing your street photos. Next week we're going to be reviewing your self-portraits. I love these shows with the self-portraits mm -hmm. because we get to see everyone that watches. Uh, we get to finally put a face to many of the names that we see every week. So infuse a bit of your personality. Make it interesting. Make it original. Show us who you are. Okay. Let's get right into the photo news. First, an update on last week's news piece about the China tariffs and how they might impact the camera industry. Those are still on, but because there was pushback about how it might impact the Christmas 2019 season, Trump and his team decided to push the tariffs back to December 15th, which, of course, that means that it won't affect last minute shoppers. It would just be stuff that was imported into the country after December 15th and everything would have already been imported if it was going to end up on store shelves by then. So you basically wouldn't see any impact until after the new year. Okay. I don't know why they wouldn't like ask around and be like, hey, does anybody, <laughs> does this date work or is that going to be a problem? That's weird. Anyway, the camera of the year. What These are the prestigious EISA awards. Which camera do you think won? Uh, These are 2019 to 2020 camera of the year. A7 III? It's the Nikon Z6. Oh, <laughs> Chris just laughed. <laughs> and the Fuji X-T3. Oh, the X-T3 is very good. And the Panasonic yeah, the X3. S1R. Wow. And the Canon EOS RP, the Sony RX100 Mark VI, that's the previous, not the, the Sony A6400 and the Fujifilm GFX100. Wow. I don't know. <laughs> These camera awards look so ridiculous. They get so much news coverage every year, but there's no criteria listed and everybody is a winner. There are so many cameras of the year. And uh, what I've pieced together from a few different sources is that they announced these Camera of the Year awards based on nominations from camera magazines. And then whenever the camera manufacturers want to mention that the camera won the Camera of the Year award, they pay them a licensing fee to use this little logo here. And so what? one could speculate that they just like to spread the awards around a little bit so everybody gets one and everybody pays Why them some I amount get of one? licensing fee. I know, I'm a little offended. A little offended. We've got a few coins. Could have spent some coin <laughs> on getting that talked about. Um, they it, the, In the description for why they picked the Z6, they said it was because it had eye detect, autofocus, and sensor stabilization. Let's just move on to the next story. <laughs> I'm furious. <laughs> okay. Okay. This also got a huge amount of press this week. The Canon cameras were hacked. Uh, a hacker figured out how to install ransomware on your Canon cameras by exploiting a vulnerability in the picture transfer protocol, PTP. So I set up our Canon EOS R and figured out what it would actually take to get done. And as you mentioned, I have a background in this stuff. I did actual white hat hacking as well as security consulting for people, wrote a bunch of books and stuff on the topic. So I know a little bit about it. Let's talk about how you would actually go about exploiting a camera. First, as the hacker, you would have to find a victim that had a camera with now outdated firmware, and that victim was about to use one specific Wi-Fi mode of the camera where the camera starts up a wireless access point. Wow. And then the, seems... the computer then connects to that access point. There are other ways to do it. You would have to wait for the camera, the victim to turn the camera's Wi-Fi on and then enable remote control. So there are a couple of steps that they have to go through. The camera then displays a password to connect to the Wi-Fi network. So you would need to get that password and you'd probably have to just shoulder surf that password to connect to it. May I ask a question? Sure. Steps two and three, can they see remotely that the the victim is doing this or do they have to like 
guess? Um, well, you would see the shoulder? wireless access point come up, but I just wanted to make the point that it, it's not like the cameras are always broadcasting this wireless access point. You have to kind of go in manually. Okay. Um, it's definitely not on by default, uh, and it wouldn't just stay on either. So you would shoulder surf their password, and then before they connect to the Wi-Fi network, you with your malicious computer would att 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 would attach to their Wi-Fi network, and then the victim would have to confirm that it was okay on the camera. And once they did this, now you're in, basically. You can just run an app on your computer. And then what? Well, then it updates the firmware on the camera with malicious firmware that could do then do anything, which in their example, they had it um, encrypting the files and then presenting, this is common in software, a ransomware, you encrypt the files and then you say, hey, if you want to decrypt your files, you send us over a Bitcoin or two and we'll give it to you. Just on their camera or can they then get access to your computer? Well, it would just be on your camera. This exploit is just for the camera. Now you could, you wouldn't have to take action immediately. It could sit in the background and wait a month until, I don't know, they were just on vacation or something, but. <laughs> Can you imagine like you just took like 30 pictures of your cat and someone's like, give me a Bitcoin <laughs> or the pictures of Fluffy are gone. I'd just be like, take them. Yeah, I guess I wanted to make the point. This is getting a lot of coverage. There's a lot of scary and sensationalistic coverage, but I cannot imagine this ever will be exploited in the real world. I don't think anybody's at risk. Definitely, no matter what camera you have, go make sure you have the latest firmware. That's always a good practice, but nobody's ever going to exploit this. This is not financially viable for any hacker. Um, a more likely alternative to get in would just be to hack somebody's computer and wait for them to run the software, but why would you even bother if you've already hacked somebody's computer? Just hold that for ransomware. Anyway. That's What's a screenshot cool of the thing? screen. That's what it looks like to be a real hacker, Chelsea. I hate it. <laughs> it looks hard. It's better than on movies when they just run like ones and zeros up the screen. That's what I put in our thumbnail. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> now we know that Chelsea made the thumbnail and not me. <laughs> I was like, hmm, how can I signify hacking? Binary code. Spooky. <laughs> okay. I do want to give a hats off to the hackers, though. I think that's that it was cool that they found that exploit and rigged up some a white hat firmware. Off. My, my, I tip, tip my white hat white to hatch. you. Ooh, this is getting too nerdy for me. So let's review some street photos. Um, if this sure. is genuinely a street photo, and it probably is, I think it's super cool. I'm going to yeah. give this one a pick straight out. Like, this is such a great character. It looks like a portrait. Yeah, he's a model. Good subject. Awesome shot, David. This is a little, it doesn't feel candid. It feels like you know this person. What's happening? Yeah, it's also not, I think what I like about street photography is the kind of slice of real life. And this person's at a fair. They're doing something, you know, this is not insight into what it's like in the city. It's just, it's unusual behavior. It's yeah. Kind of already on display. Yeah. But nonetheless, I think it's an interesting subject. Sure. How about here? I like this. It's it's street portraiture. Yeah, it's or... kind of a street portraiture. Like they're engaged with the person. It's not a candid shot, but that's okay too. And I think they have an interesting face. Sure. Um, this seems like, you know, just set up. So I'm thinking you're at some kind of event. So I think a big part about street photography is um, you're telling an interesting story. And another exciting thing about street photography is that people are very much publicly living their lives. And if you take the time to pay attention, you might find a special moment. And that's kind of what's exciting. And so to me, this feels like um, these two people are trying to put on a public performance, which I could just see. But if you can find something novel where someone looks at your photo and they're like, oh wow, they really spotted a moment maybe I would have walked past, that's like more special. Does that make sense? I will say street photography is, is hard on the photographer. It takes a, a lot, it's a scary experience. And I think a lot of photographers kind of build to that by taking pictures at a parade or at a fair or of street performers. Yeah. And those pictures aren't gonna be the award-winning street photo, but you learn to build your nerve up a little bit. You develop some skill. I think that that, I would actually recommend a different way, which would be like 
camping out in the street and just find a spot that you think is beautiful and just stay there and take pictures of the buildings. And if somebody walks through, then you're kind of gradually getting used to it. And then at least your photos are still street photography and interesting. Mm -hmm. But taking pictures of street performers, um, homelessness, like a parade, that's never, it's not gonna be that interesting. This is interesting. I absolutely love this shot. There's something interesting about the arrangement of the four different subjects. There's this sort of perfect subject separation and that none of them are overlapping, but they're all kind of evenly spaced out. Yeah, and like they go from like smallest to like bigger. And also his facial expression matches his hand expression. I just feel like he's a little mad. He's like, don't you look at my horse? I don't know. <laughs> I give it a pick. I like this one. Yeah, John, that's an amazing shot. I absolutely love it. Uh, 1979. Okay. That's, it's literally Ronald Reagan. The old Gipper. The old Gipper. <laughs> I got zoomed in there. Do you see your histogram here? How you don't have a white point? It just drops off. I would just add some highlights and then you're upping the contrast. Don't Good forget to look at your histogram, folks. Um what I, wait, I liked a few things. So I love I like his pose. I like that he's holding a cigarette, which is bad, but it's just a little bit more interesting. And I like that this guy's watching from a wheelchair because there's an interesting story there. Did he get hurt? Probably. I like the pizza on the skateboard. That was cool, too. Oh, yeah. Good eye, Justin. Now I'm hungry, Justin. <laughs> um, again, the whole right part of your histogram. Let's see. I think we might be able to bring up the entire exposure on this one and then bring up your highlights a little bit. You can do some contrast. I think what works about this picture is the sort of arrangement of the feet, the feet here, yeah. the fact that there is this negative space between them, they do not overlap. It's a split second thing. Uh, and I think the 1 1 25th shutter speed is a really good choice here. It allowed for just a little bit of motion blur. And, you know, we caught this woman leaping over the puddle, which is just so much more interesting than a regular step. Yeah, I like this picture. It's simple, but yeah. it's it tells Great a job, very Mike. small story, but it's a good one. Um, I feel like you know this person, but it's still a nice, I'd call this almost like street portraiture because she's not really doing anything. Um, I do love that she has the umbrella behind her. So you're getting that subject separation and the background is blurred, but I'm still getting an idea of what's kind of going on. Um, it's nice. Let's try it. Let's see what it looks like in a more traditional Ooh, I like it much better in black and white. Yeah, I agree. I'm going to give that a pick. Okay. This is cool. I like uh, the slower shutter speeds so that you got the movement in the hand. You have the paint in the foreground and then the spray painting in the background so you get a full story. I think it's interesting. What do you think, Toner? Yeah, I like it. I was just pondering Stolium. whether it could possibly be candid and I think it's Probably not. The photographer probably knows those people. But at the same time, it, I think it's probably a true story. So That's an interesting hobby. Like, just pull out your duffel bag full of paint. Go do it. There are spaces where it's, it's totally loud. okay. Yeah. So here we have three characters. There's perfect sub subject separation between them. Um, we have enough background blur that... Even the third subject on the left there is popping off a little bit. Uh, I And I think the interaction between the characters is, is really interesting. I, I like this shot. Yeah, I do too. I might even just up the texture a tiny bit. Now, I like this picture of this man just resting on his tiny watermelon. <laughs> and he calls it blind melon. You're funny, Frederick. It seems like he's ready for that coffee, too. Yeah, really cute shot. What's up with this, though? Uh, 50 millimeter. This photo is 
beautiful. I like the guy's casual pose. His expression. I wish there were a little more context, but I get it. He's like sitting around. This is more like street portraiture, I, f I feel. What do yeah. you think? I'm going to give it a pick. It's beautiful. Oh, I just noticed that he had a cigarette. I yeah. I couldn't really see it at first. I guess I wanted to see a little more detail in his eyes. So you might selectively dodge and burn it. I tried just quickly raising all the shadows, but that didn't give me the desired effect, really. Uh, wait, is this... A lot of smokers this time. I think <laughs> smokers are a cigarettes. common theme in street photography since like smokers need to go stand in the street to do that. <laughs> and they're static subjects. But also cigarettes are interesting photographically. I think this... Um, photo kind of captures the grossness of people like eating and smoking in the streets because this guy's chowing down this guy is eating he's eating she they're smoking this feels kind of grubby right she's smoking right over her fur there <laughs> yeah we're, we're looking it's definitely an interesting moment yeah you're right all right look at your histogram here do you see how much information Mm. That was my first thought was, I love this shot, but it's, where where's the white point? Yeah. And then if you're still wondering about your white point, you can go into white and you can press alt. And then if you drag it up, it will show you when things are finally getting blown out. Alt or opt on a Mac. Uh, can I just ex zoom in on the right side there? What's, what's happening to that door? Oh, they had to clone something out. So you have to be careful, especially with straight lines. And... When you do that, you can just kind of, here, let me make it a little bigger. You can sample the spot, and then you want to make sure you line up the line like that. How do you feel about cloning out irrelevant, distracting objects in street photography? Well, if it's like photojournalism, that's different, right? There's been a lot of controversy, especially like Steve McCurry will call it photojournalism and kind of break the rules of National Geographic, and then there's a big controversy. But if it's just your personal like art then you could do whatever you want i just wouldn't try to pass it off as like you know unaltered truth yeah i wonder though because just by calling something street photography i think it it carries the sort of promise of it being genuine unposed that's a good unedited. point yeah that's a good point I know that there's a lot of debate in street photography and the street photography community about what's acceptable. And I do think that that's something that they would probably deem unacceptable. Yeah. But at the same time, this is something I pondered a lot is like cheaters win. And if you have a group of a thousand people competing to be the best street photographer and, you know, they're all working really hard. Yeah. Then the one who works hard and is willing to cheat a little bit is going to be the winner. Well, maybe that's why, you know, people are so um, passionate about upholding that integrity, because once one person cheats, then you like how far can people go before the whole medium is kind of ruined? Yeah. Pixel's going to just take dog scratching. It's kind of a, a weekly tradition. Yeah. Sorry, we're just trying to get zoomed in. Here. What if we taught her to scratch our backs? <laughs> she could be useful. Uh, I love this photo, Gina. Um, I it's kind of off center, but I I don't know. I feel okay about that. The figures are almost ghostly. The one fifteenth shutter speed allowed you to see the movement of the slushy snow, as well as making that figure a little bit less sharp. Chris, do you have any questions or comments from the peeps? Yes, we do. In fact, there's a, a good question. What you were just talking about is there. Um, for organizations like Na National Geographic or news organizations, do they require you to submit like your original raw files or unedited JPEGs or something like that? Is there any way that they enforce that? Um, it's a good question. And National Geographic has been dinged time and time again. And then it happened again just recently with uh, photographers' amazing night photos that yeah. showed these sort of trees in the foreground and then the Milky Way in the background and keen-eyed viewers immediately saw that the whole thing had just been cloned like crazy, but National Geographic went ahead and published it. So do have they officially seen? have some sort of controls? They, I don't know, but if they do, then they're not enforcing it, and they definitely should. Like, how hard is it just to get a, a raw file from somebody and make sure no irrelevant edits have happened? It's It seems like it's the bare minimum. The photographers blame their editors a lot, which I think is complete <laughs> BS, because, no, you can't blame your editor. But I feel like Nat Geo... 
my personal opinion is that their journalistic integrity has gone down. They don't even publish real stories anymore. Yeah, they're like encouraging it almost. Yeah, they they post some pretty weird stuff. Yeah, and from my own firsthand experience, I found straight up errors in very famous articles, like the article about the Afghan girl where they said her her mother or both her parents were killed in a war when neither of her parents were killed in a war. Yeah, didn't you reach out and, and tell I them? And I wrote a... to their corrections, like, this is a really important error. They refused to acknowledge it, still haven't. Okay, there's that. All right, do you have any other <laughs> Sorry, questions? we got a little off topic there, but <laughs> yes, it seems like it would be extremely easy to check to make sure so severe edits hadn't happened, just require your photographers to shoot raw and submit those raws along with their edits. Yeah. But they don't do that. Yeah. And Kyle Preston would like to know if someone's face is in a street photography photo, do you need a model release? Um, for some uses, yeah. yeah. If you wanted to sell it as stock, you you definitely would just send it to our show. You generally wouldn't. Um, it, generally, you're going to be okay. It's going to be considered in fair use in the United States if they're um, the, if they do not have a reasonable expectation of privacy. So if they're walking in the street, it's usually okay. But again, you cannot turn it around and use that commercially, but you could probably use it for fine artwork. That does not stop them from suing you. Like I'm giving you the arguments that you would have to bring up in court. You could probably be okay if you took it before a judge. Um, realistically, sometimes people who show up in famous street photos do sue. And usually what happens is they get settled out of court. The photographer ends up paying them. So that is a distinct possibility. I can't tell you it's never going to happen because people can just sue you. If they can recognize themselves, that possibility exists, even though it should be allowed within the law. Okay. Sorry to be a bummer. I thought the shot was great. I like it's close up. It's intimate. He has an interesting face. The photographer stepped right in there, um, you know, unembarrassed, not shy. They're at 35 millimeters, you know, they're not using a telephoto lens and it works. A common technique is they'll just kind of wait and then step right in front of somebody as they're walking past. I don't know how they got the focus that close. Like it missed the close eye a little bit, but it's remarkably close. Great work. Ooh, I love this one. You, you got them like right in the lit up street so that um, there's good subject separation, even though it's kind of a busy background. Yeah, that's really key. If they were in the shadow, it wouldn't work. They Give might have even pick. done some dodge and burn to help bring that out a little bit, but I don't, I'm okay with that. I don't see that. I don't think they did, see? You don't think so? It looks like maybe he's just backlit. Either way, I like it. Um, I saw some awesome thumbnails. I want to do a re-import, but let's just Whoa, I love up. this one. Yeah. This hey. is what you were talking about, like finding a spot yes. and camping out and waiting for some people to come through. Yeah, so you found the spot, you waited, you composed the photo, and then you waited for people to walk through. It's a good way to get a great photo, but also you're not disturbing people. Ira Block taught me that. This one's great. Yeah, it really is. He's got a great pose, a good intensity. Having this in the foreground also makes it seem more candid, like we're peeking at him. Mm -hmm. Um, I really, at, at least looking at the thumbnail, I like this one a lot. Like, doesn't it feel like a Renaissance painting? <laughs> yeah. I love that shot. I know this mood and I feel it all the time. Yeah, I like this one a lot. I'm going to give you a pick. pick. Me too. I, I did it first, though, so mine's the one that counts. Let's uh, see. Any other thumbnails here catching your eye before I re-import? Well... I have a picture very similar to that, I think. It's interesting. I love when you see them with all their wares. That's very cool. Okay. Ooh, look at this one. Yeah. Great shadow. I love the yellow in the foreground and the way that diagonal line mirrors the diagonal line of the wall in the I, background. I actually think I'd go black and white because I think the yellow holds way too much visual weight. Mm. Yeah, I think black and white works too. Um, yeah, great eye. Great eye. Oh, that one's cool, too. Yeah. <laughs> That's an interesting street performer shot. Yeah, they look so miniature. I like this one. <laughs> Caught his eye. <laughs> that one's funny. I like when people have humorous street photography. And this one is really good contrast. That's what makes it interesting. Her red hair illuminated that one's cool 
Let's see what else catches your eye, Tone. Um, Ooh, this one. I think that one's cool. Yeah, I like that. It's definitely eye-catching. I might crop it differently. But I like that one. Sorry, I'm I'm having Lightroom struggles clicking around. Chris, do you have any other questions or comments from people? I'll try important oh, from the ah, show. That one's terrifying. It's <laughs> not street photography. So that in our stunners group. Yeah, we do. Keep for novices out there. I'm not sure if this is something you mentioned or they're just interested. Can you, ex in layman's terms, can you explain what the inverse square law is and how it can be used in photographic scenarios? That's from Chris A. This is one of those laws that I've just decided not to really teach, but it has to do with just how light falls off. You know, light source is going to be expanding, and thus the further you get away from it, um, the less light you're going to get. But I, I never really understood the benefit of trying to make this mathematical because we've done a lot of studio work and generally you literally just move the lights and then look and see how it looks. <laughs> and if you need more light, you make the adjustment. Like, have you ever pulled out a calculator to like use the inverse square law in the studio? All the time. <laughs> no, I haven't. Even in the old film days, I would have just used a, a light meter to see how much light was falling on a subject. And so I, I don't know. I always just have found trial and error to be a much more effective way to accomplish that. You want right. to take a look at a yes. portfolio? Let's look at hosted by Squarespace. Let's make this full screen. Um, oh, that landing page was too much. Oh, I accidentally oh, hit escape. Okay. Um, yeah, I this immediately bores me. It felt <laughs> like um an error page to me. Like I thought, like, oh, am I in the right place? And then I saw C portfolio. Just take us to the portfolio. That's what will pull us in. Hexagram photography, influencer advertisement. Ooh, that's interesting. Let's see. Contact, get in touch now. Ooh, forms. Uh, I would just, yeah, okay. Okay, the... I want to see you because I feel like at this point I'd be sending a message to just some random, I don't know, a man, a woman. Let's see about, oh, okay. Um, so I would combine the about page and the contact page. Okay, and you've got some testimonials there. I, I'm i a little baffled by this user interface. See, I just scrolled down, and then it, I can't scroll back up to see it, and I'm getting a like a different menu, and then in the upper left we have this other menu. I think what's an easy thing, I've done the same thing, okay? Squarespace is so easy, and it's kind of fun. And you start just dragging in all this different stuff and customizing everything. And then things can get a bit disjointed. And I found that the easiest thing to do is just pick a template and just kind of keep it the way it is. And update a few little things so that your page is unique, but not so much that all of a sudden the experience is confusing. Because they're like professionally designed, so they know what's easy and, and what people like to use. So I just think like less is more. Keep it simple. I remember that picture from last time. Um, I think the shots are great. You see, now I can't scroll back up. Let's check out the portraits. Um, are you bothered by the fact that it the full width pictures are so big we cannot see the whole thing? Yeah. The way I've kind of addressed this on my own portfolio is just to use a template that squeezes them down a little bit. and That one's beautiful. It will. I'll mix horizontal and vertical pictures so that it puts them side by side. And if you choose a different template, it kind of handles it automatically now. I bet if you look at this on a mobile device, they'll be presented very differently. And Squarespace is really good about giving you control over how they're presented. But you can see, like, we can't take in a photo at a time. They're actually too big. Wait, have we seen his work before? It does look familiar. Well, he's got a whole lot of great work. Yeah. Like, often that's the problem. Like. Your presentation is perfect, but you just need to take more pictures. And here I think uh, your pictures are there. I would just change the user interface a little bit to make it a little bit more straightforward. I would actually like to take a quick look at another portfolio because this person sent it in a couple of times and just 
at a glance. It looks pretty powerful. Oh, beautiful. You can see here we're having a much easier time browsing through these photos. Like none of them extend beyond the layout of the page. Those are all great portraits. Like there's a very distinct style here. Yeah, you like that. It's that their processing is all and their shooting style is all uniform. Yeah. And the color scheme. Yeah. Right. Oh, and we've got some street photography, so that's relevant to our interest today. Okay, a booking page. Oh, okay. I, I thought this was going to be, it was going to have pricings and different packages and stuff, and, and it's just got a form. Like, this is a dead end for people. But it's got a cool GIF, <laughs> GIF whatever you want to call it. Um, it's GIF. Okay, I don't want to start this. Take, take it back. <laughs> Whatever you want to call it, that's unacceptable. So, Dan, I like that you have a picture of yourself. Um, I think again, I would just, I would just combine the about page in the booking probably, and just make it contact. Have a picture of yourself, a brief description, and then I would outline what you offer because right now it says like different bookings, and I'm kind of wondering, well, I can't book street. I guess I could book portraits, but how much? What if I can't afford it and I contact him and, you know. Yeah. Just... You know what they'll do is they'll just go on to the next photographer who tells them their prices. Not everybody, but some people will feel like, feel free to send me a message. We can have a chat about your needs. To me, that feels like, oh my God, oh, I no. have to communicate. What if I have to use the phone? No. I would feel like, oh, there's a 99% chance I'm not going to want to pursue it. And I'm going to have sunk in a bunch of time, like communicating and talking to the person. And I would rather just skip it and find somebody that I can communicate with straightforward. So that's my take on it. Let's see what they had to say about Squarespace. Uh, oh, okay, wait, okay, so this is the portfolio we just looked at. They say, Tony and Chelsea and Matt Granger looked at the portfolio before and their advice was to change from the old format of black and white and color pages to categorize my work and putting the stuff that sells first. I settled on portraiture as my landing page. I think that was a good choice. And with Squarespace templates, that couldn't have been easier. I chose a new template, disregarded a bunch of images, uploaded some new ones, and I was done within an hour with my site looking much better than it did before. Thanks, Squarespace, and thanks, guys, for your critique. You're welcome, and thanks for sending your portfolio in, and I'm glad we were able to help improve it. That's always our goal. This is all made possible by our sponsor, Squarespace, who makes amazing websites that are very simple to set up, not just for portfolios, but for really any type of business. If you want your own awesome Squarespace website, head to squarespace.com slash Chelsea. You get a 14-day free trial. Just try it out. Put your pictures up. Pick the design you like. See if you love it. Try it out on your mobile phone, on your tablet. If you decide to sign up, use the coupon code Chelsea, and you can get 10% off. Thanks, you okay? Squarespace. Yeah, I'm better than okay. You didn't breathe. Pumped also, about Squarespace. You're using my coupon code, and I thought we were supposed to be competing. Are, are, you, are you mad that I'm... Not competing with you? Like, why would I want to compete with you? Because all I want to do is compete. So when I dominate, I feel superior. <laughs> okay. Um, I, there's something I like about the shot, and I think it's a sort of radiating sign that is almost a halo for her. Yeah. It's a little bit out of focus, and that bugs me a little bit, but I, I still think it's an interesting and compelling shot. Ooh. Okay. It's Symmetry. A building, but. Whoa, I did not like Mr. Longlegs there. No. Spooky. No, boy, no. Um, I like the sort of atmosphere mm, that's happening. I don't but... like the bread speckle. Yeah, I don't know what that is. But I like cool. that. I like that he's looking at that. Is it shot through a window? I think so, and I think that's why you're getting the strange mm. colors all here. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, not really street. Not really street. Hmm, that's street. I like the genuine emotion. I think this is like a street portrait. Very unusual looking. Mm -hmm. That's cool. All right, let me just back it up and see what catches our eye here. Get you that grid view. Let's see. How about these kids? What are they doing? That's why I wanted to look, but I still don't know what they're doing. Yeah, you know, it's, I, if you could have hung out for a split second and just moved a little bit, if you could have just moved like down into the right a little bit, you might've been able to get the 
boy with the hat and the background separated from the foreground subject and get the boy who's sitting um, in the background just out of the background. So that's something to think about. It, you only have a split second to do it. I understand. But I like the composition, the way he's bent over and looking at the camera. He's being framed by his arm. He's doing something. I wish I knew what it was. But overall, it's definitely interesting. Yeah, and it's a good example of sort of slice of life. It's intimate. It's close up. It's wide angle. That's, those are the kinds of things that we look for. Oh, he's trying to get you to eat at the restaurant. <laughs> I hate that because it's like, I know what kind of food I want to eat. Yeah, I don't need <laughs> you know to be reminded I mean? to eat. I got a whole system built into my body to let me know when it's time to eat stuff. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's a software thing, you understand. <laughs> That's what I thought. Hmm. Looking for street. There's a lot of stuff that's blurring the lines. This is interesting. Let's see. Again, this whole right part of the histogram is showing me how underexposed this is. It's a little better. Yeah, stp.io slash top tip. It's called that for a reason. It's one of the most frequent things we do is adjust people's black and white points for them. That's a cute picture. Yeah, it is really cute. Oh, it's Jim. Hi, Jim. Oh, I love that Jim. you join us like almost every week. That's so nice. So nice to see a familiar name. Yeah, and his shots are so good that we so frequently just pick them out, not because they're Jim, but just because we see them. <laughs> this is definitely interesting. Yeah, that definitely caught my eye. And that's the kind of thing you look for. I'm going to give it a pick. Yeah. It doesn't like it doesn't tell much of a story, but it's still eye catching. It made you ponder. That's really interesting, too. Yeah, that really is. And I even like that it's kind of unbalanced, that he's smushed all the way to the bottom of the frame, and it's showing all of these crowds. It's awkward, but this whole situation seems a little awkward. Yeah, I'm giving that one a pick. Oh, my gosh. Is this really candid? What the heck? Why is that kid so cute? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's sweet. Yeah, that is cute. Kind of looking through. I don't like those street performers that are statues. They scare me. They scare you, Justin? Uh, they're all right. It's not as scary as, like, smoking Spider-Man in Times Square. <laughs> oh, my God. We saw, like, a handful of the worst Spider-Man ever in Times Square the other day. <laughs> like, back alley Elmo is terrifying, right? Yeah. They're, I swear Spider-Man is, like, five foot two and maybe like 115 pounds and he's got his like mask pulled up to his nose so he can smoke a cigarette <laughs> and his suit has seen some hard times and it's like purple instead of blue <laughs> yeah and it's just very dirty and kind of baggy it's like a little kid's costume <laughs> and if you so much as look at him he's like five bucks for a picture you know it's, it's I'm all right good. I'm, yeah. good. I'm gonna try to wipe this from my memory this one's interesting. Yes, I really like that. I'm going to give that one a pick. Nice, simple composition. I like this one because <laughs> we should try that. <laughs> yeah, that's cute. We made it through. Oh, this I like this one too. I like shadows. Okay. This is not street, but I think you know we have a, a soft sp spot in our hearts for wildlife. It is in a street. That's true. Okay. That's You're gonna it. Feel another question yeah, and then get out of here? Chris, Chris, you got any questions or comments for us? Oh, that's neat. Yes, we do. What? There's a couple. Here's This is, I, I want to try and get this straight because I think it's a good question. We're not talking about um, focusing modes or like continuous or single focus, but I know there's some settings on some cameras where you can tell it how fast to change focus from one subject to another. You know, when you're doing either face uh, face detection or eye detection. do you, Have you run into that where that actually works or where what's the best way to set that setting? I have never had that improve things. I have only ha had it cause problems. <laughs> Most cameras have, uh, yeah, like how quickly it jumps from one subject to another. And they're like, yeah. oh, if you have people running in front of the camera, then you should make it hold on to the previous subject a little bit longer. No. And I 
shooting different types of sports. I've tried adjusting it even according to the recommendations for that specific sport, and it seems to always make it worse. It could be that I've trained myself to use the camera in the default mode. Like I'm on the AF on button or off of it, depending on what I need. And maybe I've figured out, oh, I subconsciously know when somebody runs in front of the camera that I need to let off. I'm not sure. Maybe if I trained myself with different settings, I would get used to it. But I've only had bad experiences changing. And as a result, I've never recommended anybody try to tweak it. Some some things are just like, just leave it. <laughs> just because they put settings in there doesn't mean you need to get in there and try to change everything. What do you think, Chris? Have you ever had it improve life? I remember coming across that and I, I, I tried it and I was I put it at the two extremes to see if I could see a difference when it would change. Uh -huh. And I couldn't. I'm sure there's probably some measurable difference, but it's it's kind of like trying to measure you know the difference in the speed of lightning i'm sure there's a difference but you're never going to see it uh, I, I don't know yeah i well, i did notice a difference but it, it was not good <laughs> so <laughs> maybe those are the only two options you have yeah. no difference or bad difference i like this picture because you have the white dog and this white sign kind of balancing each other and the contrast is really nice yeah sasha that's a great composition any other questions chris yeah, there's a good one here for uh, including pictures in a print portfolio for either an appointment for a job or a gig or something like that. Should you keep all of the pictures along the same theme or mix it up to show your your different capabilities? Um, oh, wow. That's kind of a broad question. Like if you're I'd say if you were going to try to sell your portraits, just stay on theme. Um, and, and if you're trying to show general photography, go general, but I would try to keep it specific to what their interests would be. Yeah, definitely. You want to mis minimize the opportunities for them to dislike you. You know, there could be some oddball piece of creative work that is off topic and that they don't like. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Tony, I feel like we did it. Yeah, I think we did it too. I was just doing one, one last import to see if anything caught our eye, but I think we can thank our sponsor one last time and get out of here. Yeah, I want to thank Chris yeah. and Justin and also Squarespace for making this show possible. Try out your very own Squarespace portfolio for 14 days for free. No credit cards needed. You don't have to remember to cancel anything. Just try it. And if you like it, which I think you will, go to uh, squarespace.com slash Chelsea. Use the coupon code Chelsea and you can get 10% off. That also lets them know we're doing a really good job. Bye -bye. Do not use the coupon code Chelsea. <laughs> Only use coupon code Tony. Tony coupon code is good coupon code. Take that, yeah. Chelsea. I feel attacked. I just stomped you. <laughs> now I am winner. Now you're winner? Well, I am, yes. we'll see. Even though we have no access to how many people <laughs> click on which one. Breaking we will the fourth see, wall sir. <laughs> Next week, we're going to be reviewing your self-portraits. I'm excited about that one because I want to see you. I want you to make your photos creative, maybe even weird. I'm into that. I want to see a bit of your personality in there. Show us who you are. It's also a good opportunity to play with like different lighting, different props, different expressions. So have fun with this one. And I can't wait to meet all of you next week. Thanks. Yeah. 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 Bye, guys. Bye, guys. See ya. Bye, Chris. That is all. The self-portrait shows are like my favorite. Yeah, me too.